You might have seen in the news last week, the First Light Fusion reached a major milestone in its quest to design a power plant capable of producing energy from nuclear fusion. We've looked a couple of times on this channel at First Light Fusion, and last year I had the chance to visit the team out in Oxford for a test firing of their fusion gun. Charge and fire. Charging. Guns charged. Firing. The press reported on this breakthrough as First Light has successfully increased the standoff distance from which the projectile is fired, from 10 millimeters to 10 centimeters. The only problem with this announcement is that I didn't understand what any of the words they used mean, so I reached out to one of the team to see if I could get a bit of a better understanding. Mila is one of the researchers at First Light and her PhD is around this topic. Well, my name is Mila Fitzgerald. Um, I am a scientist on the numerical physics team at First Light Fusion, and I'm also a full-time PhD student. But whilst I was talking to her, I got to ask her about a question that I think a lot of people come to when it comes to fusion, which is why is it always 10 years away? And I think I got to a deeper answer than I've ever gotten to before. The large reason that fusion has always been 20 years away, at least, you know, most of our lifetimes, has been. Now my approach when I do these sorts of videos is to assume that you might not have any given background prior knowledge but that you do have infinite intelligence and capability to understand and that assumption I think has been proven out in my comments section time and time again. What I want to talk about today is ultimately PhD level information. I've covered First Light like I said a couple of times before and there are deeper dives on my channel if you want the specifics but like always I'll give a quick refresher on what I consider the easy stuff. Achieving viable nuclear fusion in our lifetimes. Fusion, as the name implies, is the fusing together of light nuclei to form a heavier mass nuclei. On Earth, we often do this with materials like deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen, the lightest element on the periodic table. Colliding these isotopes together at very high speeds produces helium and a fast moving neutron. This process is capable of releasing energy because the ending masses are less than the starting masses, and that happens because mass has been converted to energy by Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. Specifically, that energy is in the form of the speed of those particles after the fusion event. Most of that speed is contained in the fast-moving neutron. And if we want to use this energy output, we do so by placing this fusion event close usually to a water vessel, so that that water vessel gets bombarded bombarded by these fast moving neutrons and heats up and we can use steam from that hot water to run a steam turbine to generate electricity and that's where I make the classic joke always that our progress as a civilization is measured in how complicated of a way we can find to boil water. It also makes us ask though, well hang on, that sounds pretty straightforward, why is fusion so difficult to achieve? It's largely because the starting materials are both bare positively charged isotopes and like charges repel. So to get them close enough together, they have to be under incredible pressures and temperatures or speeds. This is how the sun ultimately generates its energy, but it can cheat because it has a huge amount of mass. So the gravity alone pushing down on the inner core of the sun is enough to increase it to temperatures and pressures capable of fusing the particles at its core together. The challenge that fusion researchers are trying to tackle is how do we recreate those conditions of the core of the sun here on Earth repeatedly and cheaply so that it can be used to produce reliable energy? There are many different architectures and approaches to achieving fusion, but First Light Fusion has a particularly interesting one to talk about. The broad category of approach that First Light takes is called Inertial Confinement Fusion or ICF. You might have seen similar approaches in the news like that at the Nuclear Ignition Facility, but they use lasers to create those incredible temperatures and pressures in their fusion fuel. First Light, rather than using lasers, is trying to make sure that they can build something that is commercially viable as a reactor in the future. So they have tailored their approach to work rather than using lasers to instead using a very fast moving projectile fired at fusion fuel. They envision their final reactor to look something like this, an automated firing system that launches a fuel target quickly followed by a projectile into a chamber that detonates it and releases the energy from the fusion. This chamber has a continually falling liquid lithium curtain around it that captures the heat and then transfers that heat to a water vessel to create steam and drive a turbine. 
Now there are a ton of amazingly complicated topics in First Light's approach that you could cover for hours on end, from designing the fuel target to a shape inspired by the cavitation of pistol shrimp, to the warehouse-sized infrastructure needed to supply the accelerating current to that projectile. But for the breakthrough that I want to talk about today, I want to focus just on this part, getting the projectile to survive the acceleration from 0 to 40 kilometers per second in a fraction of a second. The system used to accelerate this projectile is called the electric gun, and that's where our story begins. But before I go there, I want to talk to you about a tool that I've been using to keep ideas fresh in my mind, Blinkist. Recently, I've been reading Will Storr's The Science of Storytelling, just in case I ever find myself in a situation where I need to write a compelling rom-com between competing fission and fusion scientists. A key point in Storr's writing is that audiences are particularly interested in flawed characters, which is really difficult when writing about the natural refinement and suave sophistication of the average scientist. Luckily, using Blinkist lets me keep the key ideas from the books and podcasts that I consume easily to hand so that I can quickly refresh on the main points and lessons, with over 6,600 items items covered in their library. They've also recently added a new feature that I really like called Spaces that means that you can curate and share things that you found interesting with your family, friends, and team. If you've watched this video through to this point, you're definitely someone who likes learning, so Blinkist could be great for you. With my link down below, you can start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off Blinkist annual premium. Thank you to Blinkist for supporting the channel, and now back to the video. Electric guns were invented at Lawrence Livermore National Labs in I think like the 1970s and they were operated there from the 70s through to the 90s. Um, they're also kind of used today but mainly for uh, testing shielding on things like spacecrafts and planes and they're very similar they're kind of like rail guns that operate over a very short period of time and essentially you run a current through a metal flyer um, and the electromagnetic forces created when you run the current through that flyer cause it to accelerate to incredibly high velocities. To put it in context of what this system looks like, here's some footage from last year that I captured when I was visiting First Light that shows the electric gun system and the flyer, which is their projectile, that the gun launches. And excuse the audio quality, it's an almost working fusion facility. The current will flow in on the top down through the bolt and the shim that's in there and then back out underneath. There's a tiny sort of one or two millimeter gap underneath and that's where the magnetic field is produced. And then you get this, the current flowing and the magnetic field, you get a J cross B force, a Lorentz force. This piece in the bottom here is the projectile. It's designed so that preferentially that piece of material is torn out from the assembly and is, and is launched upwards. The problem is if you're using that kind of a system and you are running the current directly through your flyer, your flyer is really vulnerable to state change. You are actually vaporize the metal often and turn it into a plasma. And that's fine if you are trying to impact something 10 millimeters away, because that plasma kind of doesn't have time to spread out. It can impact the target. However, if we're trying to shoot that over three meters, that vaporized metal lump now basically will enter the vacuum and just disperse into a cloud of nothing. I wasn't really sure what it was that was setting any of the measurements that the teams were aiming for, either that three meters or the 10 millimeters to 10 centimeters in the announcement. So I asked Mila just to give me a little bit of context as to why actually achieving a standoff distance, which as I understood it is the distance from when you launch the thing to how far the projectile actually gets, why that was actually an important measurement. Three meters is a bit specific. It doesn't, it's not necessarily going to be exactly three meters, but that's a good ballpark. And um, so one of the benefits of fusion is that unlike nuclear fission, it doesn't produce radioactive waste. But actually, when you have a fusion reaction, because you emit such enormous amounts of energy, you want to have all of your permanent hardware a safe distance from that reaction, basically. Otherwise, you start irradiating the hardware and it has to start, you start damaging it and it has to be replaced really frequently. And again, that's just not economically viable for a power plant. The milestone is really big news for First Light because we were able to launch something over 10 centimeters. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but over 10 centimeters on our much bigger machine, M3. I think the thing that really pushed it forward is um, in my PhD, I was able to create a simplified model of the electric gun, which really broke down the fundamental physics that was taking place in the device. And also the benefit of having a simplified model is you can run 
thousands of simulations very, very quickly and really explore that parameter space in more detail. It was this computational simulation that ultimately led the team to their experimental design of choice. We run the currents through a metal foil and that metal foil is below a insulating flyer. So something that doesn't co conduct electricity. And so then the foil explodes thermally, um, changes through to a plasma, and it is the thing that carries the current and experiences all those crazy electromagnetic forces. And in theory, the, the flyer that you have, the insulating flyer, just rides along on top of it. The design concept solution this left the team with is brilliant in its simplicity, though obviously here we exclude the specifics about material properties, thicknesses, currents, voltage rise times, and all of the other factors at play to make this actually work in the real world. Because that projectile travelled 10 centimetres, it will probably travel metres, because if it was going to be destroyed and if it was going to, like I said, expand into a pancake of nothing, it actually would have done that in the first few centimetres. So the fact that it's made it to 10 centimetres actually means that it's out of the woods in terms of like the danger zone. A lot of the time in science, if you don't have adequate modelling, you have to refine your designs experimentally, which is incredibly resource intensive, incredibly time consuming, incredibly expensive. To be able to be agile and move quickly, you need to be able to model things accurately. And so I think that's actually, it wasn't that there was a necessarily an aha moment, we just had the tools available to be able to do this work. What I think is really interesting about that sentiment that Mila left us with is that we're seeing that type of messaging in multiple industries at the moment. Whether it's Tesla and their approaches to computer vision, or whether it's NVIDIA and their accelerated GPUs, or whether it's OpenAI and the large language models that they're developing, we're moving into a regime where increasingly our tool sets are so sophisticated that things that were largely unfeasible to tackle in terms of problem spaces maybe aren't becoming trivial but are at least becoming possible on reasonable timescales. And it's moving us out of a regime of trying things experimentally, which as Mila said takes a long time and a lot of resources, into a place where a large amount of the work can be done in computation. And that kind of brought me full circle in the conversation that inevitably involves fusion to the end goal of well okay how far away actually are we? And perpetually we've heard 10 years to 30 years away so is that actually changing now and i thought her answer was really interesting the large reason that fusion has always been 20 years away at least you know most of my life our lifetimes has been because we didn't understand enough about the really late stage compression of the game reactions right and i know that a lot of the time in the past scientists kind of would compress the fuel down to a certain amount and would understand all the physics there and would you know, say, oh, we're nearly there, we nearly solved it. And then they compress it a bit further and they would find a whole new kind of new basket of physics that they were going, problems that they were going to have to untangle. And I think it's really important to understand that the, route, the landscape has changed because now we have achieved gain. And the great thing about having achieved gain now multiple times at NIF is that fusion, if it's going to move forward, is going to need good modeling. And once you actually have data to feed those models and to train those models and to teach them, you are then able to have much more accurate models. So it's kind of like a runaway process in a way that the more that we get gain, the better we're able to model it, the better we're able to design systems. There's still an incredible amount of fundamental science in that process. Um, and so it's quite funny, I think that actually in the future, um, a lot of the effort is going to have to be put into the drive systems now, as opposed to the targets, which is still going to be really important. But we need to think more about how are we going to create a driver that's actually economically viable, basically. So there's an interesting problem with a technology like Fusion that is at the deepest of the deep tech end of the spectrum, the most difficult of the difficult things to achieve, even compared to things like going to space where every problem that you need to antagonize, you first need to work out whether the physics of how the universe behaves is actually how you understand it, before you are then able to try and develop an engineering solution to make use of that physics. 
there are very few other domains that human beings operate in where that fundamental check and vet process of is the universe still working the way we think it is actually necessary. And that places it in a really interesting regime where by comparison to other technology innovation time cycles, it just is very difficult for humans at the moment to understand, well, where's the finish line? We just haven't looked at very many technology spaces where our fundamental understanding of the universe comes into play just so readily at every single step along the track. It's the equivalent, the only equivalent I can think to make that kind of parallel would be if we were trying to develop time travel, where you have to actually fundamentally understand the universe's inner workings before you can start to engineer a solution on top of them. That's a really interesting space to work in, but it's also really important for us either working within those fields or observing them and saying, come on guys, hurry up, to understand what the challenge is that actually needs to be tackled because I think so easily it becomes that perpetual joke and source of slight frustration of well why are we throwing tax dollars at this thing that's perpetually forever away it makes no sense I hope this conversation elucidated a little bit of the challenge and celebrated a little bit of the milestone on this journey as always thank you very much for watching I'll see you next time goodbye <laughs>